In this video, I'm going to be addressing uh, a comment that someone left on the video that I posted entitled, How I Know That David Jeremiah is a False Teacher. And what this person is, um, is it, was addressing in her comment is the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. And so this gives us a really good opportunity to address the argument that is made for pre-tribulation rapture and why it's false. But God bless this woman. Her name is Ida. So please keep her in your prayers. And the reason I say this is she took the time to write out all of the scriptures for that argument. And this is so important that we're doing this. Now, we can still be in error, but the issue is that if we're speaking, if she's speaking on the word and I'm speaking on the word, then we're just having a discussion about the word. By the word, we're speaking on God's truth. And and what does the word say? The word says that if you are speaking on his authority, then there is truth in you. So while I believe that this doctrine is in error, and I'm going to go through every single scripture that she has listed here, and I'm going to talk about it so that we can be certain of both what the word says and what the word means. Now, today they're doing some work right outside of my house on the electrical pole. So literally my entire front, like just right in front of my front yard is a construction zone. So it's kind of loud. So I apologize for that background noise, but hopefully we can get through this and it won't be too loud. The first thing that she says is rapture does not in appear in the text of the Bible. However, it comes from the Latin word rapir, meaning rapid, and the Latin word rapamir, meaning we shall be caught up. This word was taken from the Greek verb harpazo, meaning to seize, spoil, snatch away, or take oneself, take to oneself, especially used of rapture. And then she cites four verses. We're going to look at each of those verses to make sure that they are using rapture because my understanding is there's only two verses that are cited where rapture is being used and she's citing four. So we're going to check the accuracy of that. We're going to look at each verse. So here's what I'm doing. I'm going to Blue Letter Bible because it gives me that easy option of looking up Strong's. And so I'm going to be able to get a see if this is actually the word rapture that is being used here or har harpazo. We're also going to take a look at the context of how it's being used. Okay, first is Acts 8.39. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch in this context was not resurrected. This is not referring to the first resurrection, and so the context of this scripture tells us we don't need to look any further because it's not talking about the first resurrection. So by this scripture alone, we should not be using whatever this word is, whether it's harpazo or rapture. We're going to continue on and look at the other three contexts, but this is not talking about the first resurrection. So if God chose not to use, to use a different word to describe something that happens that is not the first resurrection, then why would we be using that different word. So that's the first example. Second example is 2 Corinthians 12, 2, and also looks like verse 4. So we'll take a look at that. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. We'll start with that. Okay, so verse 2, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth such and one caught up to the third heaven. Also, not, not referring to the first resurrection. There is a different word being used to describe this thing that's happening, him being caught up and the eunuch being caught up. Different word to, be, to describe that than the first resurrection. So we have no right to use that word to describe the first resurrection if God has not used it. So again, I don't need to go any further. It doesn't matter whether this is the word harpazo or, or it's the word rapture. It's not the word that God used for the first resurrection. It's talking about a different type of event. Verse 4, how he was caught up to par into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Also, still talking about this same event of this man being caught up, not the first resurrection. Now, the next one that she cites is 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. So let's go ahead and read that one because this is a little different situation than all of the others. This is indeed the word harpazo. 
but listen to how Paul is describing this. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord. So the word is caught up, uh, or the translation, the English translation is caught up. So he is describing what is going to happen during the first resurrection. This is not the direct translation of first resurrection to Harpazo. So although he is talking about the event of the first resurrection, he's simply using a descriptive word that is caught up. And that is right, that we are going to be caught up. But he has not translated the word first resurrection to rapture. And the reason that's important is because that's the way it's being described. That's the way it's being used now. No one's talking about the first resurrection. They are saying rapture instead of saying the word first res- the term first resurrection which is what God uses. Hopefully you can see that distinction and why that is so deceptive. If you cannot comment and I will continue to explain it. The last citation that she uh, listed was Revelation 12:5 and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all God- all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This is also not a direct translation of first resurrection. This is a direct translation of the term caught up, which is describing what will happen during the first resurrection. Not one of these scriptures have translated rapture or harpazio as a direct English translation of first resurrection. Now, let me tell you what is going to, what you're, how you're going to find this event of the first resurrection in the Bible. The word will refer to God coming for his people, gathering his people, or it will res- refer to the first resurrection. And the word resurrection is the word, the uh, Greek word anastasis. So the major difference in the identifying distinction is that caught up is describing what is going to happen during the first resurrection. So if you want to correctly use the word rapture or harpazo, harpazo, then you can say that we will be raptured during the first resurrection or that we will be harpazo during the first resurrection. But to refer to that event, event as rapture, what it does is it changes the language of God so that you don't understand And also so that others don't understand, so that they are limited in being able to look up what God has said about his own event. He is going to come for his people. He is going to gather his people. And this is going to occur during the first resurrection. Rapture is not an event. Rapture is what will happen during that time. And furthermore, rapture is not the only word that's being used to describe what's going to happen during that time. So now what happens with people like David Jeremiah and Jimmy Evans and all the others that preach this rapture doctrine or pre-tribulation doctrine is because there are only two places in scripture where the word rapture is being used. Now, no one can look this up for themselves. No one understands because they're using the wrong language. They have distorted the scroll of God. And now they're having to rely on man to tell them what's going to happen instead of relying on God. And you know what? They have responsibility for that too. If that's what people are receiving, instead of knowing the word for themselves, then they're going to be held responsible for that. But I'll tell you, the false teachers are going to be held responsible for both, for what they have believed and for what they have preached, because teachers will be held to a higher standard. They will be judged more strictly. Okay, here, the next thing that she says is the important difference between the rapture and second coming are as follows. At the rapture, believers meet the Lord in the air. Uh, and then she cites 1 Thessalonians 4.17. At the, I don't have a problem with that because that is what Paul is saying is that that is the first resurrection. At the second coming, believers return with the Lord, Revelation 19.14. The second coming occurs after the great and terrible tribulation, Revelations chapters 6 and 19. The rapture occurs before the tribulation. Okay, let's just break this down for a moment. The second coming is when God comes for his people. By the way, there is no reference to second coming in the word. When God comes for his people, that will be the second time he came. Hello? I mean, it's not like a rocket science, but the issue is that people have made this to be some sort of concept 
of a second coming. So now now we're we're debating about when the second coming is when there's no reference to a second coming in the word. It just says that God will come for his people. And when he comes, that will be the second time he came. And when we come back, that'll be the third time he comes. So frankly, this is really inconsequential here. I know that it's common doctrine, but it is not true. It's something that man made up. There's no reference to second coming in the Bible. There is reference to God gathering his people, coming for his people, and the first resurrection. Furthermore, I want you to consider this. The word is written for his people. The word is not written for the wicked. And so to say that the second coming is when he comes for the wicked to punish them does not take to heart God's heart. He's written this word for his people who are listening. So to say that his second coming is is when we come back with him, well, what is he coming for? He's coming to punish the wicked. No, God is descending during the first resurrection. He is descending. We will meet him in the clouds. He has come for his people. Whatever this second coming, third coming, fourth coming, I don't know what any of that is because the word doesn't reference it. So that is not something I will debate because there's no way to, there's no authority on which to debate that. God does not talk about it. So as far as the, the scriptures that she's cited here at the rapture, I'm going to replace rapture from now on with first resurrection because I just don't agree with, I, I'm not going to use this incorrect language. At the first resurrection, believers meet the Lord in the air. The, that's First Thessalonians 4.17. I don't dispute that. At the second coming, I dispute that because that is not language that God uses. Believers return with the Lord to the earth. I agree that believers will return with the Lord to the earth. That is Bible. But I do not acknowledge second coming because that is not language that God uses. The second coming occurs after the great and terrible tribulation, Revelation chapters 6, 19. Okay, so let's take a look at what she's talking about in Revelation 6, 19. And I just want to say something. If you're thinking right now, why are we indulging this? Why are we even, you know, defending? I'll tell you why. Because this is a person who was willing to list out the scriptures. And so I'm going to respond when people actually do that. Because I believe that there is a good possibility that they desire to know truth. So that's my first reason. And the second reason is we need to be prepared to defend our faith. We need to be prepared to clear up false doctrine, particularly for those who are actually interested in the truth. Okay, so my <laughs> my uh, power is out and I live in the mountains and I usually need internet in order to be able to um, like work on my phone. So I'm doing my best with the service that I have on my phone. So I'm kind of having to do this old school and actually pick up the Bible instead of going the app. So it might take a little longer for me, but you'll never know. All right. So Revelation 6, 19, this is talking about the seals. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it. Okay. This is talking about the great wrath of God. This occurs after the first resurrection. And so what I'm finding here in this section of her citations is she, the purpose of her citing is to show me where this is in scripture. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that effort to show me where it is in scripture. However, it is not, her citations are not proving the timing of when this happens. And what she has claimed is that the second coming occurs after the great and terrible tribulation and she's saying that that is occurring during Revelation chapters 6, 19. Well, I looked up, I'm, I'm not sure what she's referring to here in terms of Revelation chapters 6 and, is she saying and 19? Because she actually has six and then quote marks. And I was wondering if that was meant to be a colon. I'm, I'm thinking so, since the quotation marks are right next to the colon on the... Um, Keyboard. So I'm going to go with my theory that what she means is Revelation chapter 6, verse 19, which I just read to you. And this timing is, the timing that she is understanding is incorrect. If indeed she is referring to the second coming as when 
God's people come. So I'm just going to replace it with that. If she is saying that when God's people come back, so they've been resurrected and then God's people come back and she's saying that that is the second coming, which by the way, the reason people believe this is because they believe that the first resurrection, which they've been calling the rapture is going to be a secret event. There's no, there's no indication that that's true. In fact, we're told that everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. The first resurrection is an event for all, and people are going to remain here on the earth. The wicked will remain here on the earth. We're told this in Daniel 12, that at that time, many will rise to condemnation and many will rise to eternal life. Everyone's going to rise at that time. Everyone's going to see him as lightning that comes from the east is seen in the west. Everyone is going to see him, even those who pierced him. So this idea that this is a secret is a lie. And that is why people are assuming that the next time that God comes is acknowledged as coming because they think that the first resurrection is a secret. The rapture is a secret. That's why they believe that that is the second time that is acknowledged as his coming. No, the second time he comes is when he comes for his people. Now, when he comes for the first resurrection, people will remain on the earth. The wicked will remain on the earth and they will experience, they will be thrown into the wine press of God's wrath while his bride goes away with him for the wedding feast. And when they come back, he kills them with the sword of his tongue, with the sword coming out of his mouth during the battle of Armageddon. So there should not be any confusion about this. Immediately after the first resurrection, the bowls of wrath are poured out. The last of God's wrath, because with them, God's wrath is complete. That's Revelation 6, uh, excuse me, Revelation 16. If you want to know what happens when he comes back with his people, you can read Revelation 19, starting at verse 11. You will see that at that time, the sword that comes out of his mouth is what's going to kill people. And this is, you know, they're gathering for the battle of Armageddon, gathering against God and his people, but they're not going to win. Again, who is God acknowledging Christ coming for? He's acknowledging it for his people. The wicked don't care. So the second time he comes is when he comes for his people. Okay, so she has said at the second coming, believers will return with the Lord to the earth. No, we've already established that that is not true, that that is the second time that Christ comes. The second time he comes is when he comes for his people. The third time he will return to the earth is when he returns with his people. The second coming occurs after the great and terrible tribulation. Revelation chapter uh, 6, verse 19, we just read that. The rapture occurs before the tribulation. No, it does not. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Pay attention to the wording here. Does it say the rapture of our Lord Jesus Christ? No, it says the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which would be the second coming if you wanted to number them. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, okay? Do you hear the language? Being gathered to him. So coming and gathering his people. These are the two, these are two descriptors that he uses for the first resurrection. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Okay, so this kind of false doctrine that the resurrection is going to occur at a particular time. It's, it's been going on for thousands of years. It was going on at Paul's time as well. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until, pay attention, the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, now he's going to describe how he's going to be revealed. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Okay, that has to happen. Frankly, I believe that it has happened. But let me tell you something, it's gonna continue. Matthew 24, 15. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the earth until now, and never to be equaled again. 
What Christ is describing is what was spoken of in Daniel. So let's turn to Daniel. He's talking about a time of great distress. So the Antichrist reign has already occurred because we know that the abomination of desolation is going to be set up on the 1290th day. I've described this to you in previous videos. The first part of that seven-year period for 1260 days, his, his uh, witnesses are going to prophesy. In the middle of that seven, the sanctuary will be thrown down and the daily sacrifice will be abolished. That is the witnesses because we are the sacrifice and we are the temple. That is when the Antichrist rises from the abyss, overpowers and kills the witnesses. Now I'm going to read to you from Daniel 12 and I'm going to start from verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up. So what is he saying? From the middle of that seven on the 1260th, well, somewhere around the 1260th day, until the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1335 days. Well, wait a minute. The wicked can't be blessed. So he's talking about his people. So what did we just read? In Matthew, we read that when the abomination of desolation is set up, that is going to be the time of great distress. Why? Because the reign of the Antichrist was nothing. God's wrath that is incited from that abomination of desolation is going to be the time of great distress. So are God's people going to be caught up, raptured, resurrected prior to that? Impossible. Because the word I'm reading says, blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1335 days. That means they've already been here for the witnesses testifying, the Antichrist reign, and now they're here for the first 45 days of God's great wrath before the bowls of wrath, okay? The bowls of wrath are not going to happen until after the resurrection. But this should make very clear to you the timing, that there is no pre-tribulation rapture. And the idea of that pre-tribulation rapture, I, from what I have heard, mostly hinges on this idea that God is going to pass over his people. Well, let's go ahead and revisit Passover. When he established that concept of passing over his people, did he rapture up? Did he resurrect the Israelites? No, God is capable of passing over his people when they're living in the same town as the Israelites and Egyptians were. So she says that the rapture occurs before the tribulation. She cites 1 Thessalonians 5.9 and Revelation 3.10. Neither of those indicate that the resurrection is going to occur before the tribulation. And first of all, there is no the tribulation. There is a time of great distress that God talks about. There is a time of tribulation. But John said all the way from his perspective at the time that he was living here, we were already experiencing tribulation. What do you think being fed to wild animals and burned at the stake and tortured during the Spanish Inquisition is? I mean, I would call that tribulation. In fact, I would call that even more tribulation than what I'm living right now. There is no the tribulation. There is a great tribulation from which in Revelation, John sees that the multitude in white robes have come out of the great tribulation. You know what the great tribulation is? That time of great distress as spoken of by Daniel and by and and referenced by Jesus in the verse of Matthew that we just read. From the time that the abomination of desolation is set up, by the way, that's at the very end of the Antichrist reign. So God's people have already lived through the Antichrist reign. I mean, who would he be persecuting if not God's people? If you know anything about the Antichrist, you know from Daniel that he is going to flatter those who uh who forsake the holy covenant. And he's going to persecute those who hold fast to God's word. Revelation 12 demonstrates that, that he, that the witnesses are thrown down and that for the next three and a half years, he chases after God's people. He goes after those who hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. So this doctrine that is being laid out is completely without understanding. It is a regurgitation of what man has taught, what man has distorted. There is nothing here that is proving anything. There is only the citation that certain things will happen. And I agree. I agree with Ida that these things will happen. What I do not agree with is the story that has been distorted. So I want to, you know, to be fair to Ida, I want to look at the citations that she's listed. First Thessalonians 5, 9, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I just addressed that. Certainly he's able to pass over us. And you see in Revelation 9, that once the, once the witnesses have died, they, they've been here for the first four trumpets. We know that because they're sealed 
before those first four trumpets, before the first four angels are allowed to harm the earth. And you can see that in Revelation 7. But by Revelation 9, when the fifth trumpet is blowing, out of the smoke, locusts came down on earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. You see that earlier on in this chapter that the a star falls from heaven. That's, that's Satan being thrown out of the heavenly realms. He's lost his place in heaven because in Revelation 12, we're told that there are two things that are required in order to triumph over the devil. Number one is the blood of the lamb. Number two is the testimony of the witnesses. So once that happens, once the witnesses finish testifying, Satan is thrown out of the heavenly realms. He's been triumphed over, lost his place. He, that is the star that is seen in Revelation 9 of him falling from the heavenly realms, give, going into the abyss, being given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And then when it opens, smoke is rising. He comes out of the abyss. And you see in Revelation 11 that the two witnesses have completed their testifying for 1260 days that the beast rises from the abyss. So pay attention to the language. He's rising from the abyss and he's overpowering and killing the witnesses. So what's happening next? The fifth trumpet. The fifth trumpet at the time of the rise of the Antichrist. And that fifth trumpet is not allowed to harm those who have the seal of God. So that means that the multitude in white robes have been sealed and that they are here for the Antichrist reign. Is God able to seal his people? Is he able to pass over them? Yes, he's able to seal them. Just like he sealed them with the blood of the lamb over the doorway so that when the destroying angel came, he knew not to harm that house. He knew that he must pass over that house. Does that mean that we go and add a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine so that we can lean on our own understanding about how God passes over his people? Of course not. That is evil, that is wicked, and it is leading God's people astray. It is a delusion that people are being handed over to because they have not loved truth, because they have not loved the entire word. They just ingest this false doctrine of man and regurgitate it and rehearse it and regurgitate it again. It tells them what their itching ears want to hear because no one wants to think about being here during the Antichrist reign. No one wants to think about if they're to be, uh, go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If they're to die by the sword, by the sword they will be killed. Or being burned by fire, as is spoken of in Daniel. No one wants to think about that. And you know why they don't want to think about it? Because they've been taught a false covenant, a false salvation that says that you are already saved. You're not working out your salvation, as is indicated in the rest of Scripture. You've already been saved. And God's going to come and pick you up. Oh, he's going to pick you up. He's going to spare you from ever having to pick up your cross and suffer for him, even to the point of death. What about the rest of scripture, guys? What about the rest of what God says about what we're called to suffer? What about him saying even to the point of death? I mean, he's not, you know, like, is that poetry or something? What is that? Was this the burden of the early church? Was this the burden of Jews to have to endure these things? And Christians are off the hook at the end of the day at the end of days that's crazy that's with complete lack of understanding of the heart of god what do we not understand about being a sacrifice we are a sacrifice even unto death okay the second one that she cites is revelation three ten. having to go back to my book because my <laughs> hot spot's not working since you have kept my command to endure patiently i will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth you know this is wicked right here okay this is a select selectivity of scripture, completely without understanding. He is talking to two of the churches out of seven churches. He is talking to two of the lampstands out of seven lampstands. He is talking to the witnesses who, by the way, are not going to be raptured or resurrected before all of this goes down. And if you want to understand that, you need to go to the seals, chapter six. Verse nine, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain by the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. What, what do we not understand about that? You realize that these are the witnesses who have been slain. They are going to be, they're going to be spared from the hour of trial and testing that God is going to bring on the earth. That great tribulation that will happen once the abomination of desolation is set up. They're going to be spared from that. But you know what's going to happen? is they are going to die in the middle of that seven. Does it say that they're going to be spared from being martyred? No, they're going to be martyred. Why is God telling 
in Revelation 2 and 3, why is he telling all of these other churches, look, you've done this, this, and this, but you need to turn? Uh, if it, if that if he was just talking to the wicked, he would say, you're done. I have already spit you out of my mouth. He wouldn't say, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. He is calling these churches to repent, these bodies of believers to repent. And he is telling those two lampstands in Revelation 11, you know, here in Revelation 1, you see that he says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And then in Revelation 11, he says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it's been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. The church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia, those who have pleased God, those who have picked this up, before this seven-year period, those are the two lampstands. They are the ones who are going to be spared from the hour of trial and testing that's going to come on the entire earth. You cannot reconcile a false doctrine that claims that, that those are, are, are the ones who are going to be pre-tribulation raptured with the rest of the word. How can you reconcile that with what I just read to you about when the abomination of desolation is set up and blessed is the one who reaches 1,335 days that 45 day period of God's great wrath. You cannot reconcile what Jesus said about when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, then will be a time of great distress. Why is he warning us about that? Why would he be warning his people about that if they're not going to be here? This is utter wickedness to interpret scripture in this way. And I do realize that many people are deceived with this doctrine, but frankly, the word says that you are handed over to delusion when you have not loved truth. And so for anyone who is deceived by this, you need to search your heart about why you were handed over to delusion. I do know people who just turn and they just decide, oh, well, I'm not going to do that thing anymore because now I know it's wrong, but they don't search their hearts. And you know what? That is a wicked heart because you cannot possibly repent for the fact that you were handed over to delusion, that you did not love truth, that you turned from God, if you're not willing to examine your heart based on what scripture tells you, based on the fact that scripture tells you that when you're handed over to delusion, it's because you didn't love truth. What was going on with you? What do you need to do differently? And you know what? If you just turn and you just stop doing that one thing, but you don't search your heart, you don't truly repent, you don't truly re return to God and receive his ministry, you'll be handed over to delusion again and again. Doesn't matter if it has to do with that one thing. You will be handed over to it because that's what's in your heart. The sin is not only what you, the, the behavior that you engaged in, the delusion that you believed, the sin is what happened in your heart. That's what the word says, because you did not love truth. That is a consequence of you not loving truth. So you, if you just go on about your business and you say, okay, fine, I'll accept this new doctrine. You're making the same mistake that you made in the first place, just accepting it from man. You haven't gone to the word. You haven't searched his word to know truth. You haven't gone to him and apologized and acknowledged what you did, searched your heart about how you're going to do differently. That is wicked and lazy. There is a reason we have believed in lies. So honestly, even, even in this, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be sensitive. Okay. I, I do want to be sensitive, but I also want to reprove. Here's the thing. I look at this and I see, oh, there's all these scriptures. That's great. She's speaking on the authority of God, but you know what? You're not, you're not speaking on the authority of God. You're saying, yeah, these things are going to happen, but truly you're speaking on the authority of man because you put it together the way that man put it together. You didn't receive this from God. You received this from man because there's no way that you could just, you know, piecemeal scripture if you're actually reading the entire scripture and receiving it from him. I know what he does with me and what he does with me is the same pattern he's going to use with you. This, unfortunately, even using scriptures, and, and I guess we know that to be true, right? Because people can claim the name Jesus Christ and they can be full of lies. Please, if you're noticing that you've been deceived, you need to return to him. You need to acknowledge that you have not loved truth, that you went and chased after man's doctrine instead of receiving this from him. And I keep going back to this, uh, this Psalm 50 that, uh, that a friend of mine sent me the other day. Psalm 50, verse 16, but to the wicked person, God says, what right do you have? What right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? You hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him. You throw your lot in your lot with adulterers. What does he mean when he says that? You throw in your lot 
with adulterers, that you are joining those who speak on the authority of the world, who commit adultery with the world. You join them. If you are receiving doctrine like this from man, you are throwing in your lot with adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You sit and testify against your brother and slander your own mother's son. When you did these things and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you. But now I arraign you and set my accusations before you. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with no one to rescue you. Those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me, and to the blameless I will show my salvation. She goes on to say the rapture is the removal of believers from the earth as an act of deliverance. I am pleased to see that deliverance is being used correctly here because God uses deliverance to talk about delivering us from our own evil, from the curse, and from this world. That's how deliverance is used, not to cast out spirits. And if you want to know about that, look up every context of deliverance. Pull up an app. It's very easy to do, just as easy as if you were to go on Google, open an app, Type in the word deliverance and you can see every context with which deliverance is used. Never is it used to describe the casting out of spirits. Now, I do not agree with what she's saying. The rapture is the removal of believers from the earth as an act of deliverance. I don't believe in the rapture. You know that. The first resurrection is the removal of believers from the earth to deliver us from what? The three things I told you. We're being delivered from evil. We're being delivered from the curse. We're changed in an instant. In the twinkling of an eye, given glorified bodies, we will be like the angels. That curse will not be on us anymore. Are our clothes going to drop? I mean, I don't know about all that. It doesn't say that in the word. It says we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. I believe that we will be dressed in whatever God dresses us in because he talks about that, you know, uh, being dressed in white, fine linen, white and clean, which stands for the right, righteous acts of God's people. That's possible, but let's not, let's not postulate. So yes, we can agree on this. The first resurrection is the removal of believers from the earth. They are being delivered. That now God's salvation has come to them. Now, I want to make one mention here in Revelation 12, when the witnesses have been killed and the, those two things that are required in order to triumph over the devil, it says, now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God. Sorry, this is verse 10, chapter 12. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Don't think that that's the point at which you have been saved. Now has come the salvation because the devil's been triumphed over, but you're still working out your salvation until the resurrection. Just because salvation has come doesn't mean you have received it. The requirements to fulfill triumph over the devil, that has come. He's lost his place in the heavenly realms. He has absolutely no rights. Later today, I'm going to be talking about powers because I did have a conversation with someone the other day regarding the powers of the devil and the rulers and the authorities and principalities and all of this other stuff. And I think that it's very important that believers understand what kind of power, what, what does that entail? What does that actually mean? It's not what you've been taught. So I'll be talking about that in another video. She goes on to say the second judgment, excuse me, the second coming includes the removal of unbelievers as an act of judgment. And then she cites Matthew 24, 40 through 41. Uh, which says two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. The two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. All right, um, how, what does one have to do with the other? The, how does that substantiate that the second coming includes the removal of believers as an act of judgment? I'm not sure if she mistakenly cited the wrong scripture, but that, I mean, there's no, from my understanding of scripture, I do not see a removal of unbelievers. The wicked are left on the earth and the earth is going to be destroyed. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Those people have gone up and those who will experience eternal condemnation have remained for the uh, bowls of wrath. They gather for the battle of Armageddon. Christ comes back. He slays them by the sword that comes out of his mouth. And they remain dead until the thousand years are up and they come to life again. The devil is unbound. To test them yet again. Are you going to be deceived again? You've gone through all this. Are you going to be deceived again? And they certainly are. And they gather to surround God's people again. There's indication that some people are going to be saved there. We've talked about this before. There are some who are going to be saved only as one escaping the flames. There is a reason why these people are coming to life again. They're being given another chance. And you do see in Ezekiel... Um, I don't have the verse right now. You see in Ezekiel that there is a distinction in the, t in the third temple between sons of God 
and servants of God. Those who must bear the, the consequences of their sin, they are not allowed to minister before the Lord. They are allowed to guard the temple and the things to be done in it. So there's a distinction between those who receive their inheritance and those who are saved only as one escaping the flames. Paul talks about that in Thessalonians as well. So the unbelievers are not removed. That's incorrect doctrine. And the script, scripture citation has nothing to do with that. Oh, I think I might understand how she's interpreting this. Okay, two men will be in a field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand meal. One be, will be taken and the other left. No, if you look at the context of this, Christ is talking about those who are going to be taken are those who are participating in the first resurrection. This is not talking about unbelievers being removed. I'm sorry, I, di I didn't understand how you were interpreting that. Got it. No, those who are being taken are those who are meeting him up in the air. If you believe that this is true, show me where else in scripture there's an indication that unbelievers are being removed because there's, uh, there's no indication of that in scripture. And uh, I'll just show you in Daniel 12 that it says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Okay, we know what the time of distress is. And if you're confused about this, read, you know, chapter 11, and then you'll understand where we're at. There's going to be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Jesus cites this. He, re he reinforces this. That is occurring after the abomination of desolation has been set up. It incites God's jealous wrath. Now he brings a time of great distress as has never occurred. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered, okay? In Matthew, Jesus says, in those days. If those days had not been cut short, no one would have survived. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So when that happens, when the abomination of desolation is set up, God brings his, his wrath, and you see that a time of distress such as has never happened since the beginning of, er of the earth until now, that's when you know that the days are near. His coming is near. But remember that the word says from the 1290th day to the 1335th day. The word also says the days are cut short. So who knows? Maybe he shortens it. I don't know. But just because I don't know doesn't mean I'm going to add to the scroll either. So look, multitudes who sleep in the dust. Okay, so but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is written, found in the book of life will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, life others to shame and everlasting contempt. Uh, I was hoping that it was this was going to um, show that they are remaining. Anyway, the rest of the word shows us that they are remaining. If you want to know that, read Revelation. But we already know that God's people are going to be resurrected. They're going to meet him in the sky and the rest will remain. They're going to look on and they will remain here for the bowls of wrath. I mean, where are they being taken if they're being removed? That doesn't even make sense. No indication that they're being removed. The rapture will be secret and instant. No, it will not. She cites 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. Let's take a look. Okay, so while this is loading, I want to address the first part. Will be secret? No, it won't be secret. I mean, if you're in a field and one person is taken away, I think you're going to know. This has come from Hollywood. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what, where this originates. I know that they, you know, like Kirk Cameron's movie, other movies. I have never even seen these movies. I've just seen like the little blips of them. There's no indication in scripture that this is going to be secret. In fact, Jesus says everyone is going to see him, even those who pierced him. I don't know what this meaning of instant is. I know that the dead are going to rise first and then those who remain will rise next. That's what Paul told us in Thessalonians. So let's take a look at this citation. She cites 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imper excuse me the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. What is Paul talking about? Is he talking about the resurrection happening in, the fl in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye? At the last trumpet, by the way, he's telling us the timing of this. The last trumpet doesn't blow until after the witnesses have been killed and after that first 45 days of God's great wrath. That is when the mystery of God will be accomplished, as spoken of in Revelation 10, 7. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. You want to know when the seventh trumpet blows? You need to look up all of the scriptures that tell you what's going on at that time. But, you know, for the sake of trying to keep this video a little bit more brief, because we're already at almost 45 minutes, I'm going to stick with what she's presented. What you have presented here is that we are going to 
the, that the resurrection is going to be taken is going to take place in an instant, and that is not what Scripture says. What Scripture says that we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Not that the resurrection is going to happen in an instant. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with the excuse me, the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So what is he saying? We're going to receive glorified bodies like the angels. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the Im- with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death will be sw- has been swallowed up in victory. This state that we're in right now, the perishable is going to be changed. I mean, that should be very clear that that's what he's talking about. The entire paragraph here is talking about our perishable bodies being changed in the twinkling of an eye. You think that the resurrection is going to happen in an instant? No. The wicked are going to be forced to watch all of this. I don't think they're going to get away that easy. No scriptures indicate that this is going to happen in an instant. In fact, in Revelation 11, when the witnesses are killed and then they raise three and a half years later during the same resurrection everyone else is going to participate in, I want you to listen to what is written. Revelation 11, 11, but after three and a half days, okay, that's a day to your prophecy, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Is this a secret event? No, their enemies looked on. Is this an instant event? No, their enemies are going to watch. They are going to see God. They're going to see Christ, even those who pierced him. All are going to raise some to condemnation, some to eternal life. She goes on to say, the second coming will be visible to all. Okay, not understanding. This, Ida, I'm sorry, but you're not understanding what the second, what what the coming, uh, what you're describing is the second coming, not understanding what that means. Revelation 1, 7, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the peoples on earth will mourn because, because of him. So shall it be, amen. He is talking about the first resurrection. That is what is described as the first resurrection. What you are describing as the second coming is when Christ returns with his people. Scripture doesn't refer to it as the second coming, so you should not either. If you want to know more about it, it's in Revelation 19, 11. It will begin there. She goes on to say the rapture is imminent. It could take place at any moment and cites Titus 2, 13 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. The first resurrection will not take place until the things that I have demonstrated to you, uh, things that Jesus spoke of, things that Daniel spoke of. It will not happen until the abomination of desolation has been set up. It will not happen until the Antichrist reign, and it will not happen until God's great wrath has begun. Then she goes on to say, why is it important to keep the rapture and the second coming distinct? And she goes on to give her rationale for this. First of all, second coming is a man-made construct. I'm not going to acknowledge it. I do understand that you are referring to the second coming as when Christ returns with his people. It's not even accurate to call it the second coming because God has, God came once he's coming again for his people and then he'll come a third time when he returns. But I'm not going to use language that the Bible does not use because you can see very clearly that it is confused what God has established. And it's just flat out wrong because it's causing, it causes everyone else to be confused. If you want to be confused, that's one thing. But when you're teaching that to other people and using language he hasn't used, it's not okay. It's in addition to the scroll. The first resurrection is imminent, but it will not take place until certain things have happened. And let me help you to understand what God means by imminent. He's been saying that these are the last days for 2,000 years. To God, it is imminent, but his words are not going to pass away. Everything has to be fulfilled in the order that he has said it will be fulfilled. You cannot eliminate scripture in order to create a doctrine that pleases your ears. It's not a doctrine that will save. So in summary, I appreciate that you have taken the time to write this out, but I, I need to tell you that it's, it's incorrect. It's a lie. It is not congruent with scripture and it is based on the delusions of man. I'm assuming probably commentaries and sermons that were ingested, but the word of God is true and it's clear. 
And I believe that I have clearly demonstrated that certain things need to take place before the first resurrection is going to happen. I also believe that I have demonstrated very clearly why using language that God has not used, such as rapture, which is being used to describe an event that God refers to as the first resurrection. If you want to understand that event, you have to use the language he has used. All rapture is describing is a component of that event. Being caught up, that's not the entire event. The event is called the first resurrection. Second coming, also not used in the word. But if that were a thing and you were using it correctly, you would know that he came once, he's coming a second time, he's coming a third time. There's no delineation between these events because you're using a concept that is man-made to describe something that's not even in the right order. So I do thank you for providing these scriptures, but I admonish you to take a look at what I've said, to take a look at the rest of scripture. To the rest of you, I hope that this has helped in terms of you being able to defend your faith and stand firm in the authority of God, not the authority of man, not even, not the authority of me. I don't have any authority. The authority of God's written word, of his truth. Because remember that those who do not love truth are handed over to delusion. So if you have, if you find that you have been deceived, please return to his truth and not only return to his truth, but acknowledge it with him. You have to repent and you have to search your heart on why it was that you didn't go to the source of his word to begin with. God desires true worshipers and true worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth, in the spirit and in truth, not Carrie's YouTube channel. Use me correctly in the spirit and in truth. That's John four. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I will see you in the next video.